don't remember anything about that. The only thing that I can ever remember. Can you hear me back? Yeah. The only thing I can ever remember wanting to be when I grew up was a, uh, a pilot. Uh, as I said earlier in the little talk we had, uh, I'm sure part of it came from watching the war movies back in uh, the Second World War. You read about that. I'm sure in history books go closer. Uh, and as I was looking around here, I look at the miles and I remember a story. Every little, back in those days, it wasn't models like this. There would be a book that would come out. And the local uh, liquor store where I lived in uh, Venice, California. You lived in a liquor store? And I had some, uh, uh, books there. And I remember that about every three months, they'd come out with a new it was a, a recognition book. We had to learn how to recognize all those airplanes in the world. And I remember every time one came out, uh, I managed to sell enough uh, Coke bottles or whatever it was we were picking up in the vacant lot out there, and I would get those books. So I learned to look at all these airplanes, and basically to identify in case they ever flew over the United States. <coughs> that was back in the early 40s. About oh, six or eight years ago, I was going through the museum at Dallas Love Field, guy that was curator there, I, I was there supposedly touring a couple, two couples. But the guy that was really doing the work was the curator, and he was taking us around, and he's showing how they used to have this uh, uh, airplane recognition. And he had some of the old things he picked up, he had a couple of these little black models that they used to ask the pilots, I don't know what they do now on that, on how to identify them, and they were about this big, something like that. He picked up one, he said, just kind of be a smart, smart ass. He turned to me and he says, what's this one? I, oh, it's a B-25. I mean, you know, obvious. Federal Air Force even has them. And uh, I remember what the next one was. And he says, you're not going to get this. Nobody ever gets this. And I took a look at it. And I said, I said that looks like a Russian storm event. And he had to open the door to look and see on it. He says, nobody has ever gotten that. So, <laughs> As I think back on it, it's I grew up with wanting to be an aviator. And maybe the high point of my career by everybody else was me being an astronaut. But if I look at anything that shaped my life, that caused me to think of things the way I am now, and what I learned to do, and which made NASA really relatively easy for me compared to other things I've done, it was becoming a Marine Corps fighter. Now, how many of you out there want to be pilots? There's quite a few, yeah. And uh, let me ask you, why do you want to be a pilot? Why do you want to be a pilot? <laughs> <laughs> I love flying. You want to be a fed pilot. And you, you like you like the flying. You feel you about it. Okay. Anybody else? Why do you want to be that lady back there? You want to be a pilot? Um, I'd like to find out why some of you want to be a pilot. Okay, why do you want to uh, As a kid, I always watched the war stories um, on the Ge uh, National Geographic Channel with my dad, and I've always wanted to fly watching them. Well, I have to tell you, one of the things about <laughs> one of the things about becoming a pilot, at least it used to be. I'm old enough now where I can't say that I'm honestly in touch with how they do it these days. But one of the things that you got out of becoming a pilot, especially in an early age when you're still getting your mind formed, is you learn to be in command of yourself. You are responsible, especially flying single engine fighter planes, you are responsible for whether you live or die, whether you performed well, didn't perform, people were counting on you. Uh, and when I was flying a career, for example, I can remember time and time again, I'd fly, and I'd fly over maybe some ground troops down there in Korea, and I often had that thought, I don't know if I could handle that with it. I mean, I really didn't know, but as long as I was in that airplane, I felt like I could handle anything. <laughs> <laughs> and 
because well, you reminded me, do you remember uh, Wing cigarettes? Yes, yes. And they, I didn't smoke at that age, never smoked, but you, they had little cards in them mm -hmm. with airplanes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remember that? I um, collect so many of those things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go buy them out of the cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't grow up thinking about being a pilot. Uh, I, uh, I always appreciated the, the, what was going on in the air, and partly because the, my hometown in southern New Mexico, Silver City, was on a, a major flyway, uh, military flyway, and during World War II and the Korean War, there were a vast number of airplanes that would fly over. And, I got, and that's how I learned how to identify airplanes, was watching these yeah. fleets go over. And I do remember that uh, my dad had been a Marine in uh, World War One, and he was the equivalent of a fighter pilot by being in the Marine cavalry. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, in, uh, one day uh, in the fifties, we uh, all of a sudden these uh, formation after formation of uh, C one nineteens, so called boxcar. Uh, well, flying boxcar were going over, headed west. And my dad uh, and I were watching those, and he said something's going to happen. Well, this was, of course, in the Korean War. And about two weeks later, the uh, Marines went into Incheon. And uh, I don't know whether anybody else figured that out, <laughs> but it was pretty obvious something was going to happen. As as I went into Korea in Incheon. You did? Aviators were supposed to get to fly over cities in DC. Yeah. Four or something like that, yeah. and it was some master sergeant that they really needed there in a hurry. They put him on the DC-4, sent me down to San Diego, and I had to be a, uh, a platoon leader for a month at sea, and we landed in Incheon. I didn't know a thing about ground trips. That's how I got to Korea. I landed in Incheon, too. You learn something every day. <laughs> the, uh, my, my training uh, really began when I decided to volunteer for the Scientist Astronaut Program. Uh, Deke Slayton had insisted with, with the NASA management that everybody coming into the Apollo Program had to qualify as a pilot. And there, was, there were uh, six of us selected in the first scientist group, and that was group four of the astronauts. Uh, two had already had pilot training. Bill Kerwin uh, was a Navy flight surgeon who had just completed carrier ball. Selected. Uh, uh, Kurt Michael had flown F 86s in Korea with the Air Force, and so those two were pulled out and, and, re, and, and recertified in the T 38 uh, Talon. The, uh, the, uh, the rest of us were sent off to uh, pilot training with the Air Force at Williams Air Force Base. And, and that training began with uh, Cessna 172s. It was the first year that the Air Force went back to tra training uh, jet pilots in propeller airplanes first. Uh, why did they do that? Well, they were trying to save money. It was a lot cheaper to wash people out in a Cessna 172 than it was to wash them out in a, in a T-37, a twin jet Cessna. And uh, by about a factor of five or six, I think, something like that. And so uh, we, we started uh, with 30 hours of 172. Then uh, 90 hours in the T-37 twin jet Cessna, which converted jet fuel to noise. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Did you ever fly a T-37? Never. Uh, you ever get close to one? You still hear it. Yeah, I know. And anyway, uh, and then uh, 120 hours in the T-38s. <coughs> and that put us in the same uh, flying category, at least, as the other NASA astronauts. Well, they had their wings. Yeah, they, we were turned loose just like everybody else. You know, that, that's the nice thing about once you qualify as a pilot, you go out there and as Wallace said, you're responsible. You're responsible for the airplane, you're responsible for yourself. And in fact, Deke Slayton used to uh, defend having these airplanes or and us flying the airplanes by saying it's our only psychological trainer. Everything else we did, you make a mistake, you reset it, you try again. T-38, you make a mistake, you don't get to reset it. You've got to figure out how to get out of it. And uh, again, that builds that sense of responsibility, which
which is a unifier, I think, among all the people that yes. were astronauts in those days. I think so, too. That's what I got my wings in, right there. F-6 head up there. Shot down more enemy aircraft than any other airplane in the Second World War. Huh? I used to, in the, we'd go out there to that airplane, and I could see through the blue paint, I could see the Japanese flags. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> the Corsair, the Atlanta Corsair. Well, the Corsair is here. Yeah, did you fly? That's the F-6 Yeah, but I mean, did you fly? No, no, no. That's probably one of my biggest disappointments. Hell of a That's what I hear. Anyway, we're reminiscing. Uh, <laughs> somebody must have